In this video, we're going to take a look at the inverse of a relation, both graphically and also algebraically. So to begin, we're going to take a look at uh, what it means to um, have an inverse. So the inverse can be found by interchanging the x-coordinates and the y-coordinates of the ordered pairs of the relation. So in other words, if I have an ordered pair x, y, to get the inverse ordered pair, uh, we swap them. So instead of x, y, I'm going to have y x. So the mapping notation will be the same. Instead of x, y, the coordinates become y and x. So let's take a look at this example here where I want to sketch the graph of the inverse and then afterwards let's state the domain and range. So we're not enlarge this to make it easier to see. So to begin graphing I'm first going to identify four points on my original graph. I pick the endpoints and then I pick two points in the middle where they change direction. So you want to pick every point where it does change direction. So for my table, I am going to choose negative 6, 4, negative 3, negative 2, 0, 1, and that last point is 3, 1. So to graph the inverse, I am going to simply take my x and y values and I'm going to swap them because that's what the inverse is. So I have 4 and negative 6, negative 2, negative 3, 1, 0, and 1, 3. So I'm going to plot this on the same grid so that we can really see the relationship here. So we get 2, 1, 0, and 1, 3. So I'm going to connect my four points. Really important that you connect them in the same order that you label them in the table. I've seen students where they graph it in any or connect them in any way, but it's important that we connect them in the same order that you have them in the table here. Now, if you tilt the graph at 45 degree angle, you can actually see the left side here is equal to the right side. Now, to even make it clearer, if I plot 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, and so on, and also negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, and so on. I'm going to connect these points. I'm going to connect them with my ruler um, as a dash line. And that actually is my line of reflection. And we can see that the left side here is equal reflected on the right side. And this line is called the y equals x line of reflection for the inverse graph. So let's take a look at the domain and range. So the domain here we can see it's from negative 6, so on the original graph, and it goes all the way to positive 3, which is right here. And the range, the lowest or the smallest y value here is negative 2. And the largest y value, which goes all the way up to here, is positive 4. Now let's take a look at the inverse. So the inverse, the smallest x value you can see here is at negative 2. And the largest x value it goes up to here which is positive 4. And the range, the smallest y value is negative 6, and it goes all the way up to positive 3, and that's my green graph. Now if you look, you can actually see that not only did my table of values swap, but my domain has become my range, and my range has become the domain of the inverse. Now lastly, the invariant points. You'll see that the point which didn't change, which stayed the same, is actually right here, right on my line of reflection. And that's at 1, 1. So the invariant point is 1, 1, which is, just so that we can recall this, it's on the line of reflection, which is y equals x. All right, so the inverse of a function, um, we can write it in the form x equals f of y because it has swapped, so x and our y swap, 
Now, if the inverse is itself a function, we can also use this other special notation, f with a little negative 1, and then x. And it's read as f inverse. Now, really important to note that this is just a notation, and the negative 1 doesn't mean that we're writing this as a reciprocal. So it does not mean 1 over f of x. It's simply a notation. If you did want to write 1 over f of x uh, with an exponent, that would actually equal f of x. And then the negative 1 would be on the outside to say that this whole f of x would actually be the reciprocal. Now, when the inverse of a function is not a function, uh, we can probably uh, restrict the domain, or we can try to restrict the domain to obtain an inverse for a portion of the original function. So recall that the vertical line test can be used to test if a relation is a function. So remember, if we draw the vertical line, if it's a function. Um, so to know if the inverse is a function, we can actually use the horizontal line test on the original graph. So if more than one x value will produce the same y value, then the inverse is not a function. So here's a good example. So we have y equals x squared, it's an, um, which is a function, but its inverse is not. And we can test that. So if I draw just a quick little graph here. So this is my y equals x squared graph. If I draw a vertical line, or sorry, a horizontal line, we can see that the horizontal line crosses at two points. Therefore, the inverse, which I'll draw here, which looks something like this, that won't be a function because when I draw the vertical line, you can see that it crosses at two points. So we can actually use the horizontal line test on the original to test for the inverse. So how can we restrict the domain? So let's go back and draw this again. So there's my parabola at y equals x squared. So one way we can do this is to only take half of the parabola. So let's say we only take the right half. So if we do that, then the domain would have to be restricted to be x is greater or equal to zero. Now, of course, we can also take the left half and then we would then restrict the domain to be x is less than or equal to 0. All right. So our last point here, um, so the inverse of a function reverses the processes represented by that function. So functions f of x and g of x are inverses of each other if the operation of f of x reverse all the operations of g of x in the opposite order. And the operations of g of x reverse all the operations of f of x in the opposite order. So therefore, to find the inverse function, you can interchange x and y in the relation and then solve the resulting equation for y, which will be the opposite operations. So let me clarify what this means. So let's take a look at an example. So here I have um, f of x equals 2x minus 3. So I'm going to swap my x and y because that's what we do when we are trying to find the inverse. Okay. And then I'm going to solve for and isolate y. So you can see that right now it's going to be is 2x minus 3 or 2y minus 3. So the opposite operation would be plus. So I'm going to move the negative 3 to the right. Sorry, to the left side. So this will be x plus 3 equals 2y. Right now it's 2 times y. So to isolate the y, I'm going to divide both sides by 2. So the inverse is going to be x plus 3 all divided by 2. Okay, let's try a different one. one that, so this was a line, so let's take a look at a parabola. So again, we're going to swap our x and y. 
and we're going to isolate our y. So opposite operations, instead of plus, we're going to minus. So we have x minus 3 equals y minus 1 all squared. The outermost function, um, the operation, sorry, is the square. So the opposite of squared is to take the square root. So we have the square root of x minus 3 equals y minus 1. Now remember, when we take the square root, we actually have the plus and minus of the square root. Lastly, we have minus 1, so we're going to now add 1. So our inverse, when I add 1, will be 1 plus or minus the square root of x minus 3. Now the very last one here, uh, we have f of x equals x divided by 2x minus 3. So this is a tricky one. So we're going to swap our x and y. And every time you see an x, you have to replace it with a y value. So we actually now have two y's. Now, how are we going to get rid of two y's? Well, let's first get rid of the fraction. So we're going to multiply both sides by 2y minus 3. And the reason that we do that is so that the denominator can cancel off. So on the left side, I'm going to multiply and distribute this. So I have 2xy minus 3x equals y. Next, what I want to do is move all the terms that have a y to one side. So I'm going to move it all to the left. And if it doesn't have a y, I'm going to move it to the right. So the 3x doesn't, the 3x term doesn't, I'm going to move it to the right side. Now I still have two y's, but to get a single y, what I can do is to factor out a y. And by doing that, I now have only a single y right here. And our last thing that we can do is then just to, because y is multiplied by this binomial, I'm going to divide this binomial so that I have y is equal to 3x all divided by 2x minus 1. And that is our inverse.